We are in a series called Supernatural. This has been a lengthy series. This has been, this is the 13th sermon in this series. So just out of curiosity here in all of our other locations, has anybody been here for all 13, like you've been here in person for all 13 sermons? Wow, look at you guys go. Good job. Let's get them some pumpkin pie. I haven't even been here for all the sermons. I was out of town the other week, so good for you guys. We've been studying the letter of 1 Corinthians, which the Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth. And throughout this letter, he has talked about a lot of different topics. Just to name a few, he's talked about church divisions and the spirit of God and the mind of Christ and sexual immorality and marriage and lawsuits and church discipline and the gifts of the spirit and worshiping decently and in order in church services. Paul is covering a lot of ground in this letter. But before he officially wraps up this letter, he's going to come back to his primary message that he always comes back to through all of his New Testament writings, and that is the message of the gospel. And today, we're going to look at a chapter where he specifically takes a look at this pillar truth of the gospel, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 is probably the most thorough and extensive passage in the Bible that we have on the topic of the resurrection of the dead. And so that's what we're going to be spending some of our time today looking at. And you're going to find that when we live this life with the resurrection in mind, it'll give us clear eternal perspective. It'll give us clear motive to live our short life on earth well, because what we do in this life impacts our experience in the next life. So let's take a look at what the Word of God has to say about all of this. Starting in 1 Corinthians 15.3, it says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scriptures said. Now let's talk about this resurrection miracle for a moment. No other religion claims a miracle of this magnitude. Jesus himself accurately, in detail, predicted his own death, burial, and resurrection, and it all went the way that he said that it would. No other prophet, no other teacher, no other religious figure out there could have fulfilled all of the numerous prophecies made about a miracle like this over the course of thousands of years of history. Because keep in mind, the Apostle Paul says, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus all happened just as scriptures said. Now, there's a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament about this miracle and a lot of prophetic language, even going back to the very first book of the Bible. But I wanted to look at one particular passage because it hits all the categories of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus all in the same chapter. Isaiah 53, starting in verse 5, says this, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And this is speaking of the torture and the crucifixion of Jesus, being pierced by the nails, pierced by the thorns in his brow and the spear in his side. Verse 9 says, He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. And that also happened. Joseph of Arimathea gave the tomb that Jesus was buried in. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. And when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life, and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. Let me ask you this. How is he going to enjoy a long life if he's dead and buried? The answer is, he's not. (laughs) He rose from the grave, Okay, just as the scriptures said. Something fascinating about this as well is this prophecy in the book of Isaiah, this was made some 750 years before the event actually took place. Isn't that amazing that the Spirit of God revealed to the prophet Isaiah uh, centuries, yeah, centuries, 100 years, right? Centuries before this happened that Jesus would die and be buried and be resurrected again. It's pretty fascinating. But beyond the biblical prophecies, let's also take into consideration the people who saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead. Because Paul continues on to say, he was seen by Peter and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Now, these are people who 
not only saw Jesus, but they walked with him, and they talked with him and had conversations with him. They shared meals with him, and they even touched the crucifixion scars in his hands and in his side. The Bible tells us that for 40 days after Jesus was raised, he spent time walking the earth, interacting with real people who could really see and hear and feel his physically resurrected body from the dead. And in terms of the the historical validity of this miracle, it's important to keep in mind that many of these eyewitnesses of Jesus, several hundred people, many of them were actually martyred for their faith. So, so take this into consideration. Is it possible that 500 plus people all in the same span of time and around the same topic just suddenly became blindly delusional and just so committed to some random cause? I don't think that's what this was. I think what it was is a deep conviction that they all felt in their spirits because they had seen him. They had talked with him. They had spent time with him. They saw that the tomb was empty. And beyond that, they're given the opportunity to walk away with their lives if they will simply deny a set of facts. That's a pretty easy, you know, an an easy deal to make. If they would just deny that he was raised from the grave, they could walk away with their life. But instead, they were willing to die for what they saw with their own two eyes. That's pretty compelling historical evidence that several hundred people were willing to do that. It's pretty amazing stuff. Not only that, but we have multiple historical documents in the forms of the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that all harmoniously, in detail, attest to the empty tomb. And we don't have any other uh, contemporary historical documents of that day and time that refute the empty tomb. That's very interesting. Now, the, the Jewish leaders of the day, they put forth an alternative reasoning as to why the tomb was empty, but they never argued the fact that the tomb was empty. So my question in light of all of this is if historians have been able to dig up things like the writings of Josephus, who was a a Jewish Roman historian, Josephus and Tacitus, these two guys who were contemporaries, they lived at the same time of Jesus, and they wrote extra biblical work and historical documents that have referenced the life of Jesus and his followers, if history has been able to dig that up, and evidence of the life of Pontius Pilate, and evidence of the life of the Apostle Paul, how has history never been able to dig up the body of the most contentious, debated over, worshipped man in all of the earth? I'll tell you how, because his body's not on earth. Because he rose from the grave. He ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father. And someday he's coming back to gather his people to himself. The tomb is empty. That's an amazing thing. And it's a pillar of Christian belief. And it's important that we have accurate theology when it comes to the resurrection of the dead. And the Apostle Paul is going to continue on to tell us why. He says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. In short, what Paul is saying is, hey, if God doesn't raise the dead, then Jesus was never raised. And if Jesus was never raised, then guess what? All of our sins are still counted against us and we don't have any hope past this life. We're all going to hell anyway, so we might as well eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Wah, 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 wah. Like that's a bummer, right? That's a bummer. Thankfully, verse 19 is not where this chapter ends. He goes on into verse 20 and says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. He says, our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death and the law gives sin its power. But thank God. He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is good news. 
This is good news for all of us today. This means that all who are in Christ will one day be raised from the dead and our bodies will be transformed into glorified bodies just like his and we will no longer be vulnerable and susceptible to the power and the destruction of sin and death. And we can now, because of Jesus' death and his resurrection, we can live this life with an assurance, a certainty, a hope that in the next life we will live forever with him free from the power of sin and the grip of death, and that is worth celebrating. That is the message of the gospel. That's the good news for all the people of God today. But that's all one day. So what do we do with this information today, right now? Let me just check here in our other locations. Anybody currently or you have formerly been a parent of small children? Yes, God bless you. God bless me. God bless us all. Everyone every one of us. You'll be able to relate to this. So my wife and I have three girls all under the age of 10. And I've found that on an average day, if I'm working my day job and then I'm trying to be present in the home, I'm trying to be an intentional father and yet still trying to, you know, be healthy and and exercise and, and get enough sleep myself. On average, when our kids go to bed, my wife and I have about two precious, short, kid-free hours left of the evening before we have to go to sleep ourselves. Because whether or not we sleep at night, as sure as the sun will rise, those kids will be up at 6 a.m. yelling their conversations to each other, slamming doors, and running down the hallway because that's what kids do. And God bless them, they're great. But we only have a short window each evening for kid-free time. So as such, whatever we do at that time, I'm always judging very critically because I always go through the filter of, is this worth it? Because this is time that we can never get back. So for example, we love movies and TV shows. We love anything that'll, that'll make us laugh because life is short. You got to laugh along the way, right? So uh, before kids, we would just watch Anything, willy-nilly, whether we had seen it or not. Someone recommends a movie or a show to us, sure, we'll try it out. Because the mentality is, if we don't like it, we got plenty of time. We can just watch something else that we know that we will like. Not anymore. Not with kids. Uh Uh-uh. Now, anything that we're about to watch, I always go, "Mm, is this going to be worth it? Because we only have two hours here, so I don't really know. So I'm just going to tell you right now, if you ever recommend a movie to me, I might just flat out not even try it. And the reason for that is because I love you and I, you know, we're friends and I want us to stay friends and I don't want to harbor anything against you if your movie recommendation wastes those two hours of my time. I'll have to work through that with the Lord. Uh, Is this worth it? I'm always asking, is this worth it? This is a question that we ask about many things in life, right? And let's say that you're out in the Napa Valley enjoying some fine cuisine. You're going to have to take a moment when you're at that restaurant, you're going to have to ask yourself, is this delicious food that I'm about to eat worth the ridiculous bill that I'm going to have to pay. That's something you got to you got to balance for yourself. Or you know, you're working at a job and the the paycheck's good, but is this paycheck worth the frustrating work environment that I find myself in? We have to ask this question quite a bit in this life. And I find that our limited understanding of life after death can often cause us to question whether or not it's worth it to go all in with the things of God. I don't know about you, but if you're like me, maybe you've, you've thought, okay, so if, I, if I've got this straight, I pray the prayer, and then once I pray the prayer, I'm in, I'm saved, and I'm going to heaven either way. So the rest of that Bible stuff, is that just like extra credit, or <laughs> what's, what's the deal with all of that? Because I've heard that sometimes the Christian life can be a lot of suffering and questions and rules, so all of that for, for what? Some vague idea of a perfect life after death? Like, does, does anybody else ever wonder what heaven's going to be like? Is it just me? Like, are, are we really just going to float around on clouds with togas and harps all day? Or, you know, can you eat as much junk food as you want without getting sick to your stomach and ride any roller coaster ride that you want to without having to stay in line? Or, or like every Christian bookstore out there wants you to believe, Is it just one beautiful, constant, amazing sunrise through picturesque clouds while lions and lambs play on the grass together? Is that what heaven is like? (laughs) When you're putting together a a sermon to preach, 
you want to be able to give some, some practical application for, for the here and now. And that can be a challenge when you're talking about heaven and life after death. We have somewhat limited context of what that's all going to look like, but we can't ignore the fact that 54 out of the 66 books of the Bible reference and speak about heaven, and Jesus himself spoke directly about heaven some 70 times in the gospel. It's clear that the word of God is trying to communicate something to us. And our life on earth is so short compared to the span of eternity, it would be foolish for us to focus exclusively on the things of this life without at least trying to align ourselves with the eternal perspective that the word is trying to give us. So what does the word of God say about life after death? Well, that's what we're going to talk about for the remainder of our time here today. I've got two points for you note takers. First point is this. There are eternal rewards for the redeemed in the next life directly connected to our stewardship of this one. There are eternal rewards for the redeemed in the next life directly connected to our stewardship of this one. Now, there, there is an inheritance for all believers. Uh, there is a general widespread inheritance of salvation that we will all receive on the day when Jesus returns. First Peter 4, or excuse me, 1 verse 4 says, And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Now, this is something that's going to take place, again, on that day when Jesus returns. Only thing is, no man knows the day or the hour of his return. All we know is that every passing day is one day closer. And Jesus himself said in Revelation twenty two twelve, 12, Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. Now, this means that we have a limited time to steward well this life that God has given us. So my question to you today is, how are you stewarding your life? Are you living in such a way that you are mindful of and you're, you're calibrated to the king and his kingdom? Are you stewarding well the things that God has loaned you for this life? Everything that we have is a gift from God. Every good thing that we have is a gift from God. And God has given you time. He's given you the breath in your lungs. He's given you intellect and strength. He's given you relationships and influence and resources and gifting and your family. He's given you all of these things, but they have been loaned to you for the purpose of stewardship. How are you stewarding these things in this temporary life? 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. So are you building something temporary with this temporary life that won't go with you into the next one? Or are you building something eternal with eternal impact? Because the word of God is clear that there are specific rewards given to those who allow themselves and their lives to be shaped by an eternal perspective. There are specific rewards. And the Bible, it doesn't give us a whole lot of detail as to what these rewards are. But we do know this. It says in Romans 8 that we are fellow heirs, co-heirs with Christ. There's multiple passages throughout the Bible that talk about the believers ruling and reigning with him. Every once in a while, you'll come across a verse. There's several specific crowns that are mentioned that are given to believers in particular circumstances. You've got the crown of life and the crown of righteousness and so on. And so when we come across verbiage of these crowns and these treasures in heaven, these things are indicative of authority and renown and, yes, even tangible rewards in the next life based on circumstances in this life. And the Bible says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no heart can fathom what God has prepared in eternity for those who love him. So whatever these rewards are, they're probably even better than we think that they are. Like, just think about this. Think about the fact that 
We have an amazing, gracious, loving God who would say, I'm going to give you the free gift of salvation and eternal life with me. I'm going to take away all death and pain and sorrow and sickness. And in addition to that, you ain't seen nothing yet. Like, that's pretty amazing. Whatever that is, I want in on that, okay? So there's a couple of verses here that I want to just give you some examples of some of these rewards. 2 Timothy 4.8. It says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Okay, so you have a, a specific circumstance and a specific reward attached to it. Jesus says in five, or excuse me, Matthew 5, 11, and 12, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. A specific test, specific reward. Luke 6.35, Jesus says, But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. So we see that there are specific rewards given to those who are willing to live their life in such a way that they attain the prize. Now, I've heard some people say that, Our life here on earth is God's testing period for mankind. And then eternity is God's rewarding period for mankind. God wants us to live a life that will pass the test and receive the rewards. And that's why the Apostle Paul wraps up this whole discussion of the resurrection of the dead by writing this. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. In other words, in reply to our question of, after we pray the sinner's prayer, all this other stuff, is it worth it to do? The answer is a resounding yes, it is. All the things that you do for God's purposes in his kingdom, all of it is worth it. Every small act of kindness that you show to another, God sees that. Every time that you fast and you pray and you set yourself apart in holiness, God sees that. Every time that you sacrifice your time and your energy to serve others, God sees that. Every time that you serve so generously and financially into building the kingdom in its purposes. God sees that every time that you are ridiculed and ashamed for your faith and you stand through that and you endure it with grace and patience, none of this is in vain. There will be a reward. Do not grow weary in doing good for in due season, if you endure, you will receive a reward. There is a reward for all of these things. And and I understand that Oftentimes, in fact, I was just praying this morning before these services, and I was saying, God, thank you for what your word is doing in my heart through studying all this, because if I'm being honest, sometimes when I'm going through it in life, it feels like I only have enough mental and emotional energy to get through the day in front of me. Does anyone else ever feel that way? Like, okay, the, just, the, just getting through this day, let alone heaven and eternity, like, I, I, I need some strength. I just feel like God would come to you as he did to me and say, I'm going to give you grace for the season that you're in. And not only that, I'm here to lift your eyes because I have bigger and better and greater and eternal things in store for your life. And if you're in here and you're thinking, okay, this all sounds great, and I would love to build something eternal with my life, but I don't even know where to begin, all of these things, they can be done outside of a church context. But if you're looking for a great place to start, at any and all of our locations, we have a Discover class. You can go to Discover, you can get connected to what's going on here in the church, and we'll put you on the dream team. Anybody on the dream team in here? You guys are amazing. All of our dream team, they're the ones who serve every weekend and help these services happen. We'll put you on the dream team and we will give you opportunity after opportunity to serve other people and to build something eternal with your life, all right? And there's one other specific reward that I wanna mention that's found in the Bible and that's the reward of those who lead people to Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20, Paul says, after all, what gives us hope and joy And what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. Imagine the joy of walking the streets of heaven and somebody comes up to you and they say, thank you for leading me to the Lord. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here right now. Wow, how amazing is that? So when we stand up here 
And we encourage you guys to, you know, invite people to church and share your faith and go on missions trips. It's not just to pay it forward because somebody did something nice for you, so you should do something nice for someone else. No, every time that you open the door for someone to be led to the Lord, you are leading one of his lost sons and daughters back home to him. Guys, if one of my three daughters was missing and she was lost and she was in, her life was at stake, I would do anything. I would do absolutely anything to get her back into the safety of my house. Can you imagine the joy and the gratitude that must be in the heart of the heavenly father when we lead his lost sons and daughters back into his house, back into an eternal security with him? There will surely be a reward for that. So what I'm saying is, don't be shy about it. Love people. Guys, life is short. It's happening quick. Love people. Be gracious to them. Be nice to them. Be a light in their dark world. Build them up. Encourage them. Invite them to church. Invite them to the Christmas services. Share your faith with them. Because as you do, know that the Father is seeking his lost sons and daughters, and he wants to use you to bring them back into his house. And when you do, there will surely be a reward. Amen? Awesome. Point number two is this, and I'll have the band join me on stage. There are two different resurrections and two different eternal destinations. Jesus told us that a day will come when all of the dead will be raised, not just the righteous, but all of the dead will be raised into one of two very different scenarios. And in John chapter 5, Jesus is speaking of himself in the third person. And he says, For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Now we know from context of the rest of the word that Jesus is not talking about earning your way into heaven or works-based salvation here. Jesus is talking about the difference between someone who repents of their sin and they allow the grace of God to shape the rest of their life in doing good deeds, and then someone who refuses to repent of their sin and they continue stubbornly on into it. And Revelation chapter 21 gives us a little more detail as to the two possible eternal destinations that each person will be resurrected into. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. But cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Every person will be raised from the dead to one of these two eternal destinations, either life eternally with God or the lake of fire and the second death. I want everyone in the room in all of our locations to hear me very clearly. God does not want any person to experience that second death. God does not want any person to experience that second death. 2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. The Bible is crystal clear on this fact. God loves every person, regardless of the life that you have lived or what your life looks like down to this very second. God loves you. The Bible says that you were fearfully and wonderfully made by him. You were made in his image. He created you with a purpose and a plan from before the foundations of the earth. God had you in mind. His thoughts towards you are good and they outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. God loves you so much. And because of that, he is patiently extending his mercy to you in this life so that you can repent of your sin, receive his free gift of grace, and make him the Lord of your life. But guys, listen, there is a window. There is a window 
of opportunity to respond to this invitation. Because just as God is merciful, he must also be just and righteous. And he will not allow the disease of sin and death to stain his creation forever. He has to deal with it, but he does not want you, his sons and daughters, to get caught up in that process. And as such, we only have this life, only this life to respond to his free gift of grace. So if you are here and you're far away from Jesus or at any of our other locations watching in, if you're far from God right now, please hear me. I plead with you, I urge you, I beg you even, open your heart and your mind to Jesus. Open your heart and your mind to Jesus. He loves you. He's not here to condemn you. He created you for a reason. And he's not just myth. He's not just a historical figure that once walked the earth a couple thousand years ago. He's not the figurehead of some religion. Jesus Christ is God in flesh. He walked this earth, he taught, he sat and he ate with sinners and he showed them grace and forgiveness and acceptance and love and mercy and kindness and he healed and he raised the dead and he did miracles and he revealed to us the heart of our Father in heaven. He revealed to us God's will for us and more than that, he died on a cross for our sins and he rose again and now he is alive to this day he has a plan for your life he sees you not only that he has seen every wicked and evil thing that you've ever thought or spoken or done every evil intention and motive you've ever had and he loves you completely and entirely in spite of those things Romans chapter 5 tells us that even when we were enemies of God, still in the midst of our sins, still opposed to Him, He died on our behalf because He loves us that much. Jesus does not want you walking through this life bound by your sin, feeling broken and confused. That's why He died on the cross to set you free from your sin so that you could experience life and freedom and joy in Him. He doesn't want you being dragged into eternity away from Him by your sin. That's why He rose from the grave to free you from the grip of death he did all of that with you in mind he loves you your sin wants to destroy you there's a real devil he's not a big deal compared to God he's really not but he's real and he hates you and he wants to separate you from God and he wants you to honestly he wants you to die Jesus himself said he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, Jesus comes to give you life in abundance. Jesus comes to give you peace that will surpass all understanding. Jesus comes to give you joy and freedom, freedom from addiction, freedom from pain and confusion. Jesus comes to give you a purpose for your life and an eternal life with him forever. And so in just a moment, at all of our locations, we are going to extend an invitation for all of us to repent of our sin and make our lives right with God. I pray that you take us up on this offer. God has created you and given you this one life, this one life to discover and receive the unthinkable immense love that he has for you. I pray that you take him up on this invitation and that one day when we see each other in heaven and we look upon Jesus with our own two eyes, you will know it was worth it. It was worth it.